Also, did I pronounce your name correctly? Um, Let me know if it's Femela. Yeah. Femela Balearan. Yes. Femela Balearan. Okay, thank you yeah. for letting me you know. <laughs> okay. okay, got this. All right, we're live. So now I will introduce our lovely speaker for tonight. Famela Balearan is a data analyst at Rappler who graduated from the University of the City of Manila. She is actively in search of what it means to humanize technology, especially when it comes to the usage of data. So that's, that's what our talk is all about today. Um, take it away. Hello, hello, hello. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so... Yeah, my talk today is um, about how we could use or yeah, how we could use soft data to understand ourselves. This is mainly inspired by um, Georgia Lupi. She's an information designer at Pentagram and uh, she advocates data humanism, which um, is something that I'm not really like the jobs that I had before, I used to be a data engineer and also a data analyst. And we're, our jobs is mostly about um, getting like how to um, optimize, um, optimize processes. So it's not like very humanized way of looking at data. So that really, when I came across Georgia Lupi, that, that's really like a, a shift in perspective for me. So um, as someone who's working in data, I feel like Plato's cave is a good or um, a very fitting, um, a very fitting um, illustration of, of what we do with data. Um, reality is, is um, captured or um, projected through the shadows and people who are working with data aren't really directly working with reality, but um, um, just a projection of, of reality. So um, when translating um, our reality, our, experience, our experiences, it could be categorized into hard data which, or soft data. Hard data, um, it deals with facts and, wait, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna exit for a while because, uh, there we go. <laughs> okay, okay. So hard data deals in facts and figures, and it often involves counting or measuring some phenomena such as sales, future revenues, or production units. Um, another examples are temperature, your height and your weight, um, your age. And for soft data, it seeks to record people's attitudes, beliefs, feelings, and perception. And just by um, this definition, we can see that um, the reason why hard data is usually um, used by businesses because they're easy to capture. Soft data, on the other hand, is um, contains, um, it requires um, new ones and, and handling it. So I want to introduce you to the McNamara fallacy because um, it is, it usually is um, based on, on the jobs that I have done, like previous work. Like this is usually um, the, um, I'll say weakness or weakness of a, of a business because usually they just focus on the hard data. Um, in summary, McNamara fallacy is, um, can be summarized by this line. If it cannot be measured, it is not important. So during the Vietnam War, I wish I have a much more like um, less uh, <laughs> like a less violent example. But the the name McNamara is actually McNamara fallacy is actually um, coined because of of this um, of this uh, event. So during the Vietnam War, the uh, America thought that it's actually winning because they're 
counting the the um, the number of enemies that we're able to kill, but um, they they didn't take into account that during that time, um, their enemy, <laughs> the, the Vietnamese, they have this desire to be free from the foreign rule following the departure of the French in 1954. So um, not factoring in the, the moral of their enemy, they have like a incomplete view of, of what's happening. So they thought that they're winning. And the McNamara fallacy is, is named after the US Secretary of Defense during that time, who was Robert McNamara. Um, so soft data, it is complex, it is fuzzy, but um, it is also very rich. So um, I think I experienced before in Rappler handling um, soft data. And um, it is hard to work with soft data. It is very complex and yes, fuzzy, but the amount of, of um, insights that one can get from, from these kinds of data set is, is actually very telling of of our behavior, our collective behavior, and our collective like aspirations. So one of the people who have embraced data complexity is Georgia Lupi. She's an information designer and partner at Pentagram. And Pentagram is a multidisciplinary design studio. So on, like, as you can see here, like this is the usual um, data visualization product done by Georgia Lupi. It's, as you can see, it's not, uh, it's not uh, something that you usually see for, for data visualizations. Like it's not bar charts or pie charts. Like they have their own way of, um, their own way of, of representing a story or telling a story through, through data vis. And, um, there's, I'm going to be, um, I'm going to give like a copy of this presentation so that you can watch um, how Georgia um, works with um, complex data. I just feel like it's like a, like if I have a time later, I'll show it. But since this is not like a, this is just a, an introduction to soft data, I'm not going to show it. You can just explore it in your own time. Um, Georgia Lupi is also um, an advocate for data humanism. She, this, um, this, her manifesto is that small, she prefers small data instead of big data, um, places importance on data quality, imperfect data, subjective data, inspiring data, serendipitous data, um, data possibilities, um, data to depict complexity, um, which is for me like a very big shift in how I was trained to deal with data because um, in, in um, business intelligence, you're actually more, you're expected more to, to, to like cut through the complexity and give, give the, the clients the, um, um, to give the clients like a watered down version of, of your insights, of your data insights. So to actually embrace complexity by depicting it in your data visualization is something that I, um, I as a data analyst had to, um, had to um, like take some time to accept. So yes, um, she also likes drawing her data and um, spending time with data. If, if you like watch a video of how Georgia Lupi um, works with, with um, her projects, like you can see that she really takes the time to, to understand her data set, um, which in contrast, um, having worked as a data engineer, um, cleaning data and, and 
working with databases. Uh, it's it's uh, it's um, like there's a contrast because um, as a data engineer, we were um, we were expected to automate processes. So when you automate processes, you don't take into account um, 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 what's the term? You don't take into account um, like the nuances in your data set and, and you're forced to, um, to remove complexity in, in your, in your um, data model. So another is for her, data is people, which is correct. Um, data is not just numbers. Although the usual, um, the usual training that I, do, that I got from a bootcamp is that um, data is usually, it's, it's hard to think of data as people, especially when you're, um, especially when you're um, using mathematical models to predict their behavior. Um, and lastly, for her, data will make us more human, which is refreshing because usually data analysis is done so that um, businesses can make their processes more efficient um, to, to optimize their um, um, optimize their current processes. So um, treating data as something that will make us more human is also um, a shift in perspective for me. Uh, this is an example of, of Georgia Lupi's project with Stephanie Posavec. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but I think this, this is a really big, um, um, big project for Georgia and Stephanie. What they did was um, they sent each other postcards um, containing their, their analog um, data visualization. Um, they have prompts for, 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 I think, per week. So um, as an example, here is um, their data vis analog data vis for their week of indecision. Uh, so you can see um, like they have like their own way of, of representing um, their data points for, for that week. Um, what else? And they also produce like their own, um, they also produce a visual journal called Observe, Collect, Draw. Um, where you can um, where you can do what they they did with the dear data project I really like this prompt this this prompt about envy it says what do you feel envy is about what does it teach you about yourself for five days acknowledge and recognize all the moments you felt jealous and scribble them on the right hand page what I like about the way they represent data is it's it's really just like you're scribbling and it's it's like a it's a fun way of of self-reflection and else so now we'll go through how I used it for um for my own um understanding of myself and reclaiming myself so as a um to give you like a background, like I was diagnosed with, last year I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but um, when I, um, but right now I am just, um, I was, my therapist now says that I'm, I was misdiagnosed and I actually have um, anxiety and, and depressive um, disorder. So, but, but um, the thing is when I, was in a very depressive state like last year because of the pandemic. It felt like I wasn't myself anymore. Like the usual things that I find um, that makes me feel alive, like I don't find, um, I don't feel alive when I do them anymore. So I like created my own personal workbook 
I called it um, 100 days of occupying both body and spirit. So um, what I did was instead of, um, instead of having a definite scale of like from one to five with one being the lowest and five being the highest, um, I refrained from like doing that because I don't want it to seem like one end of the spectrum is bad or, or, or negative and the other end is like positive. Um, so as you can see here, the legend says that um, I could fill in the meaning of the symbols, like what does my emotional spectrum look like? Uh, I had to put um, this writing here because I wanted to remind myself that, okay, this isn't about um, always, always being in a state of, of like five circles or whatever, whatever emotion I put in there. So um, I told myself that remember the upper and lower part of your emotional spectrum are neither good nor bad. They are just, they just are. Um, emotions are data. They serve as a signal to tell you what you are in abundance of and what you lack. The emotions are data um, idea actually came from um, uh, from a book, I think, Emotional Agility. I'm gonna, like it's, um, I cited it at the end of my presentation. So I, I, I forgot who the, the author was. I think it was Susan, Susan David. And the idea here that it's blank because um, we have our own, um, I don't, I didn't want it to be like just a simple happy, sad, um, depressed, or like very excited. Like I wanted to have um, like a different way of describing my feelings because I find that sometimes I describe my feelings in images. Like for example, my lowest would be um, like, I would describe my lowest um, emotion to be not wanting to be here anymore. Not necessarily suicidal, but just, you know, just, I just want to disappear, like um, evaporate. And my highest or like the highest part of my emotional spectrum will be like, um, everything is beautiful. Like that's, that's, uh, that's um, my, um, that's my, uh, that's how I would describe like the, the highest part of my emotional spectrum. So as I've said here, the goal here isn't to be, to always be in a certain state of feeling, but to be present and to listen to what your body and emotions tell you. Lend an ear to them as you would to a dear friend, then act based on what you hear. Um, do you need rest or do you require movement? And then the workbook is actually divided into three parts. The first part is breathing in life. I, I um, record the length of how long I, I, I practice box breathing and also record how I feel afterwards. And like if there's like something that I, I want to note about that, um, about it during that day. So at the start of the section, I put this, um, I put this paragraph in front of, of the, um, like a title page, because I like reminding myself of why I'm doing something. Um, I said, breathing is a dance you perform with the universe. You take in oxygen and in return, you make carbon dioxide available for the plants. It's very fitting that the ancient Greek word for breath or pneuma is also the word for spirit in religious context. Breathing in, you take in life. Breathing out, you give life. The second part is tuning into the body. I record what physical activity I did for that day because sometimes I just feel like doing yoga, but sometimes I want to do um, like a, an eight minute or 20 minute um, workout routine. And then I also record like when I did it, like if it's in the afternoon, the evening or in the morning, um, also how I feel feel afterwards and also if there's like a something that I want to note for for 
during that day. So um, in, my, in the title page of this section, I said, take up a physical activity, whether that be running, high intensity interval training, yoga, or just walking around the neighborhood. And this is important for me to note because I used to exercise because I didn't like how my body looks like. So I specifically told myself that you're doing this activities not because you hate your body and you want to get in shape, but because you're amazed at how your body enables you to do these marvelous feats. Um, isn't it a blessing that your body is capable of movement? Movement is medicine. It brings our attention back to our bodies. And just like any other intimate relationships, it may be awkward at first, and that's true for me. But if you let it unfold without pressure, it could be one of um, the most profound relationships you'll ever have. Um, the, last, uh, the last section is entitled Restoring the Spirit. It's actually just a, um, it's just a box. Like I have, um, like in the page, there are four boxes, um, one box per day. And my prompt is, what piece of beauty have you encountered today? Maybe something mundane, maybe something extraordinary, perhaps a song, a poem, a scenery, a certain item resting on the sidewalk. Describe it in words with a photo or an illustration. And the reason, my reason for doing this is this. Um, it's something that I got from John Donahue about the importance of beauty. He said, it is precisely when things are difficult and you're vulnerable that you really have to mind yourself. I love Blaise Pascal's idea that in difficult time, you should always keep something beautiful in your heart. Perhaps, as a poet said, it is beauty that will save us in the end. And yeah, those are the three um, sections in, in, my, um, in my workbook. Um, I don't record the feeling for this section because it's just really for, um, I don't know, I just really want to um, like catalog the, the beauty that I see every day. So for the um, doing physical activities and breathing exercise, I actually plot them. Um, again, for this one, I have to always remind myself that the goal is not to like always attain like the five circles, but um, you know just to see like if there's a pattern in a pattern in um, pattern in my um, in the fluctuations or the rhythm of my emotions, or um, also want to see like if there's um, <laughs> if there's a, a correlation with how long I do um, I do a physical activity or a breathing exercise because I assign a different color for different lengths. Like for example, for breathing exercise, I use yellow for um, um, one, like doing a breathing exercise for one to three minutes, I think. And then blue for four to five minutes and then um, red for more than five minutes. I don't know, I just wanna, I'm just, I was just curious if, if there's a correlation with the length of, of time that I do a breathing exercise. So yes, that's how, um, that's how I use um, soft data or at least like I try to do, to use soft data to um, help me with, with my mental health. There are still so many things that I would like to would like to um, would like to change with my workbook because um, as someone with my um, someone with my training with my background, I'm really um, I'm I'm trying to like optimize for things. So whenever I see that, uh, whenever I see that um, my plot is like for a certain day, my plot is in, in like in the um, two circles line. Um, I kind of panic, and and that's that's why I really like how Georgia Lupi 
does her um, does her journals because as you can see like it's not like it's a linear um, it's not like a linear thing for her like it's, it's actually just like you're just scribbling and um, yeah I'm, I'm still trying to to um, tweak my my own um, workbook so that's the end of my presentation um, are there and here are the resources that I use for for um, coming up with this presentation um, that's the end that. wow that is all I have to say um, thank you so much <laughs> for being vulnerable and sharing so much that with us um, just to open it up a bit too. Yeah, this really touched me a lot because I too tend to be um, really data driven, even to my own detriment. Like I would always like track my, my weight and whatever mm. I would eat because I'm in a, I, I pursue a hobby that like requires me to like be so particular with my body. So like mm. whenever um the, the, I like seeing the data like progress, but when it go my way, it can just send me into like a spiral for like, yeah how long <laughs> yeah but like seeing this um talk it reminded me like why I started tracking um this kind of data in the first place because it yeah. really helped me um reclaim myself yeah but like mm -hmm. at least whether it was good or bad having that like self-awareness like oh I did too much of this I did too much of that it allowed me to I guess um take control of my life back in my hands because I remember before when I tracked I felt like I don't know everything was so out of hands for me and I felt like I didn't like I didn't have any like control in what whatever would happen mm -hmm. in my life so yeah thank you for this wonderful mm -hmm. and unique yeah I guess that's why it's, it's like I really wanted to um like right now it's it's like the way that I track it is the same as how businesses do like their own dashboards and I'm trying to find a way to not make it seem like um um, not make it look like that because I feel like my, my brain is wired to um, like view it and like how you view your your own tracking and I'm wondering like if there's another way to to track our progress without it um, affecting us in a way that will make us um, not see our progress which is yeah. <laughs> which is ironic because you're actually tracking something because you want to see your progress <laughs> yeah um I consult with a nutritionist frequently and their advice regarding that so that I wouldn't like obsess too much about like mm -hmm. the scale or whatever uh, my measurements so um to think of like non-scale victories like oh do you feel stronger um are you like binging less do you have more energy like you know soft data like that because mm -hmm. even if I guess um, what your measurements they don't reflect how you actually feel like having writing down those like really positive um wins can I, I guess help you feel secure mm -mm. in what's happening yeah. to you yeah <laughs> maybe there's like a a parallel for that in the, <laughs> in life yeah <laughs> All right, I will um, proceed to our Q&A. So first, okay. I love your writing style in the workbook. Uh, do you have um, any writing inspirations? <laughs> and thank you for seeing our small community as a safe space, Heart. Um, huh, that's weird. Um, I, okay. Like, even if my um, writing inspiration, um, John O'Donoghue is, like, a huge... Um, huge inspiration for me when I was writing um, for this um, for this oh god the workbook I'm just gonna type his name yes um, who else I, I can't remember other hmm. oh also like um this I'm not sure if you know about this but this is another it's not a very data-ish um, journal but um, this um, this website and this journal inspired me a lot on in how 
um, I think I speak online or like how I wanted to frame my my workbook. It's the moon lists and it, they also have like a very relaxing visuals. Got this. Oh wow, this is these are all gorgeous. Oh my oh my gosh, it's so pretty. It reminds me of like the coast art. Yes. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> I love it. I'm gonna save this. Thank you. Um other question. What is your thought process for the workbook? What insights did you use as a starting point for making this? I think I needed to I also needed to track my moods when I when I started taking meds, just to see if they are working, and also um, I wanted to see, um, like if it does, because you usually when when you're not in a good mood, people will say like, oh, you just um, practice meditation or like do um, do. Um, exercises and I wanted to see if, if that's actually true um the thing is no no at least for me not not always like sometimes I'll finish uh, a yoga a yoga um, routine and I would still feel not good afterwards mm, I see I see thank you so much for this and actually, I'd like to um, open this up to the audience. Maybe you guys have want to ask questions personally, or maybe you want to share your own stories related to, yeah. I guess, how you deal with your own soft data in your yeah. lives. I wanna, I wanna hear from other people. <laughs> I mean, like for instance, like not not the call to you, yeah, but I feel like you're the type of person. Their, their projects, I always see them, like, their last FM, they're always, like, tra tracking, like, all the music there. Um, yeah, and other people in this audience as well, like, I see them, like, tracking, like, what they read, um, mm -hmm. everything they consume. I just find it so telling of a person, so interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I find, like, um, I guess, joy in, like, learning about other people through, mm -hmm. I guess, what they collect, what they find dear to them in their lives yeah that's why i really love arena as a platform <laughs> <laughs> yes i wait i'm trying to look for that um it's kind of like goodreads but it also like gives you um like an insight of the kinds of books that you read like based on your reading um you're reading Ooh, is this the, the story graph yeah right I, I think so wait let me see yeah, story yeah. Graph. yes i need a good read. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes yes okay i have yet to try this though i just saw it from someone i i've tried it i, I haven't been frequently updating it though but mm -hmm. what i've learned from it so far i guess I really like the algorithm, but wait, but mm -hmm. whenever I find it social media. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But yes, opening up to the audience again, I, I'd love to like hear like all your stories or make maybe how like this touched you, this talk touched you. I really shy about mine. Eh? <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> Actually, I will. I will call. Yeah. Ooh, thank you for the show. Um, Nikki, I I know you're 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 interested in like mental health because I'm sure this resonated a lot with you. Can you like tell us more? <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yes. Thank you so much for that talk. It was really nice, and I do relate it a lot to my psych studies. I am studying like motivation and emotion lately. Um, and recently, I actually had to open an arena channel as a homework to kind of trap mm -hmm. my emotions for over the past week. Uh, mm -hmm. And some things that have helped me there were like seeing them as emojis and just widening <laughs> my vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, just so it's not such a linear scale like one to ten. Mm -hmm. And 
you're able to capture the new ones you know, when you know all of these different emotions, like what the words for are them. So I'm just going to share like this resource. Uh, it's called the Emotions Wheel, if you've heard of it, for the people here. Um, it's just super helpful for finding like the exact word the, the, uh, for what you're feeling and just learning about psych in general. Like, oh, there's a difference between, between envy and jealousy and like uh, shame and embarrassment. There's just so much to learn about yourself and like studying psych for me has been like such an avenue for that. So yeah, that's that's my story. <laughs> I love to hear other people's examples. Yes, thank you so much for sharing. I'm glad that the talk was able to connect with you that way. Ooh. How about um you, Tia? How did this talk like connect <laughs> with you? Ooh, positive psychology emotions wheel. I love how everyone is like just sharing like resources. That's the chat. I love this. I will like read through all of this. If not, how about you, Jake? Hello, are you there? Hi. Um, yeah, um, I know you're currently studying Philippine studies, right? I just wonder how that connects with like the topic here today, soft data. Yeah, and I know you're interested in marketing as well. So <laughs> yeah, cool intersection. Um, well, actually, like my question was more of I want it's 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 more personal, like because I I've tried journaling before, but then like it always feels like such a chore. And I have to like, I wake up and then like I have to write in a month. Parang. How do you get over that? Is there like a way or like a secret that I don't know? Oh, Pamela, you're muted. Actually, there's really no secret like you just really have to do it like based on experience oh. like I haven't found like if anyone has like please tell me because for me like um like I really if I wanted to um like, there's no way around it you really have to journal <laughs> oh, yeah. do other oh, yeah. do other people have their own um way of going about um, when you don't feel like journaling like what do other I, people I feel like it's a habit like you, you just have to show up like I tried to do that with like notion like I would like um, try to track oh how I felt about every week but you know whenever things get busy or I really feel sad I, I just tend to fall off the wagon mm -hmm. So yeah, I really don't know how like people get to like track consistently. Mm -hmm. I guess if you really want to keep it up, it has to be like something that's slow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the caveat with that long is if you're trying to build up like any habit for emotion regulation, whether it's journaling, whether it's yoga, eventually it's not supposed to be like a chore. Like if, if it's just meditating for one minute, is that that thing mm -hmm. then that's fine if you want to journal but I mean if you like you see yourself journaling but it's really not that kind of day try to like shift your attention towards what other strategies can help you or like what you need for that day which is part of the, the work book that Pamela showed earlier um I'm actually curious I've seen your graphics on Instagram do you have a, a design mm -hmm. background um how did you arrive to that kind of it's even like a brand for yourself at this point. I don't, I'm not sure if I do have a brand because I pretty much just do whatever I like. Um, I guess, um, hmm, hmm. I guess since I don't really do it for, um, I decided not to do it for like as a career, just something that will supplement my, um, skills in data analysis but I didn't want to um, do design as a career because I wanted to um, like I didn't want to be constrained with having to cater to other people's taste 
So what I usually do is I'm on the internet a lot. And whenever, whenever I find something that I like, I always just ask myself, like, why do I like this until I've, ar- until I've arrived um, at this point where it's kind of intuitive for me, like what feels good for me. And that's just really my um, benchmark. Like if it, go- if it feels good for me, like I'm okay with that. Or um, basically, well, my, my personal taste with design is anything that makes me feel calm, like that's the kind of design that I want. So that's also how I do my designs. Thanks for this. Yeah, like honestly, um, the way you design right now is better than like, I guess ninety percent or even ninety nine percent of like most like design <laughs> undergrads <laughs> I've seen. Maybe not not this year, but like in other countries too. <laughs> <laughs> I love um, to hear I'm, more. I'm yeah, just sure. curious, like um, you're all still students, or um, some of you are already working. Yeah, we're a pretty um, unique um, mix. Like most of us are college students. Um, some of us are um, taking up a grad or and working at the same time. Yeah, yeah, but pretty young. Okay. Yeah, it's like I, I really gravitated towards like this organization because I haven't, like ever since I graduated college, like I've been um trying to find a community that doesn't you know not not that but is also taking our humanity in consideration with along with um um along with um our fascination or passion for tech and i'm wondering um how our you balancing um how are you balancing um catering for for capitalistic um um system while also having like you're all very idealistic and talented so um as um young upcoming um um working people like how how are you um, thinking about that now or preparing for that now? Oh my goodness, that's a loaded question. But <laughs> I feel like it's something we've always thought about because um, for context, um, I guess, like ever since like, yeah, I'd love for Chia to chime in about this. We talk like forever about this. If you're there, hello, <laughs> Chia. Uh, how do you want to break down this question, Bianca? <laughs> <laughs> I guess you can first talk about like the, your background of how like developed like I guess developed <laughs> and then like contrast it to like I guess the existing like orgs the tech space here and like how we found ourselves I guess and maybe even like you know career crisis because we had so many much career crisis it's like this year you know trying to balance like oh I need to earn money I need to you know work at mm-hmm. the same time I want to be an artist and stuff it never ends it's so painful <laughs> yeah. well I'm undergoing a career crisis right now um mm-hmm. not sure if you heard but I quit my job <laughs> when you started talking <laughs> um so that's an example um yeah when we started develop Bianca and I were at the same high school in Zabel Nikki also went to Zabel for a brief period <laughs> um but back when we started I feel like most of the learning I was doing was like from the internet and there were no like tech communities or like people around me um, that were specifically interested in tech and what I wanted to explore. So we started out as a very like technical organization teaching people how to code or like what is Python? Um, what is HTML? How do you make a website? How do you like start designing in Photoshop? So it was like that mm-hmm. very, that kind of like very hands-on tech org. And I think develop it's been run by the same people. We are not the kind of org that like turns over things to the next generation of high school seniors to use on their college applications. It has grown with us, which is, um, it has its own implications. And 
Um, obviously, Develop has turned into a more like speculative and intersectional organization mm. um, that isn't even directly just like it's hard to describe ourselves as just a tech org because mm. everything we do like revolves around tech. But then our goal is to like decenter tech um, and everything mm. we explore essentially. Um, so I think the more that we've been forced to kind of closer integrate ourselves into industry the more we've actually been distancing ourselves from this very like technical and reg- regimented view of what that could be because Mm-mm. we're more interested in the implications of our work um, mm-hmm. our relationships with people what kind of tech work actually makes us happy and what tech work actually makes us feel in control mm-hmm. of like shaping a philippines we want as opposed to like mm-hmm. recognizing how oppressive and like um <laughs> essentially the I believe like the we believe that the tech structures that currently exist and that once fascinated us when we were in high school, like the promise of like be the next Mark Zuckerberg and build the like the next mm-hmm. big thing, mm-hmm. and inherently like operates on the exploitation of like Filipinos and like mm-hmm. all these unpaid work laborers and mm-hmm. things like that. And it promises techno solutionism to anyone, um, which is really not the way to go. So mm-hmm. it's really in like figuring out ways we can use technology as a tool, figuring out that our lives don't center around technology necessarily, but instead technology can be used as a bridge to augment it and help us like understand ourselves more similar to what you were sharing in the talk. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's a lot of what develop is about now. And although it kind of seems silly because like, why would we be thinking about these very ambiguous things when the Philippines doesn't even have like very good CS education like when we don't have the fundamentals we were privileged like be able to teach ourselves the fundamentals I think it's like I don't know it's just even more important for young students to think about mm-hmm. these kind of questions as they embark on their career mm-hmm. um, sorry that was a long mm-hmm. answer but Bianca yeah, and I have a lot of feelings yeah. about this mm-hmm. we've been talking about this non-stop essentially for the past few years figuring out what direction we want to go in Mm-mm. Yes, it's it's actually refreshing that I am not a part of lots of, I'm actually not a part of any like tech community, like um, any like Python or or AI, um, AI community in the Philippines, because I find that they usually like they're so excited about the tech, but they're not talking about like how it will affect people. And that's not or, or that's very like, I don't feel comfortable being around people who are like that or, like, being a part of community that doesn't think about um, the implications of, of the technology that they're building. So, yeah, I, I'm, really, I'm really glad I found you. I don't even, I, I don't know if, how I even found it, you. I think it's, it was Bianca. I think she followed me first. So I'm just really glad that um, you guys exist. Yeah, thank you for inviting me too. I'm gonna cry. No, we're so happy to be here. <laughs> thank you for giving me time. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, and I guess to add to that, I feel like the way we're trying to like balance this, you know, really hard fine line right now is that um, I guess all of our endeavors are like dedicated outside of work. I guess we're dedicated like towards you know those kind of intersectional interests. Like when I'm not um freelancing, for instance, like I really like writing um like really critical essays on mm-hmm. tech and also like um contributing to communities like this and help like develop like you know a kind of like critical mindset I guess that's what fulfills me like oh I may be a slave of capitalism but <laughs> at least I'm working I'm aware <laughs> I'm self-aware somewhat and I hope people other people will be self-aware yeah I am curious to know if there's any other tech you found familiar that you feel has made you feel more human or more calm um so that we can also check it out. I know there are, usually it's meditation apps, but are, mm-hmm. are there any other sites that you think captured the way that you want to build tech? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to look through my um, Notion page, like anything that I saved. Huh. Okay. Hmm. 
Let's see, let's see, let's see. Web places. Um, but I can't think of any right now. I, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna have to like go back. Um, I'm gonna have to um, like look through my, my bookmarks for that. I can't, I'm not, um, I can't think of anything right now. <laughs> Um, I think the moon list Actually, is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when the moon list. Um, what else? Um, hmm. Oh God, sorry, I I'm I can't think of any. <laughs> Oh yeah, like related to that question, I guess. I, I feel like mm -hmm. um the problem of like most meditation apps, I guess, for people is that um there's a lot of like emphasis on quantified aspects, like oh you have a streak, you like a number of you you meditate for a number of minutes. I feel like I guess it loses meaning mm -hmm. of the act in the first place. Yeah, gamification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for like, hmm. that makes me wonder if there's like another way to do that. Thanks for the idea. Now I have something to, um, <laughs> I have something to dedicate myself into while I'm taking a break. Like I actually left Rappler like three weeks ago because I needed some rest. Yeah, I felt burnt yes, out. Yes, yes, good thing I I really felt burned out. Like it's it's a good place, but very like high, like the very fast game. paced. Yes, very fast paced. Like mm -hmm. I can't. I need I need some rest. <laughs> so what you're doing is, I guess you're just working on your own projects right now, right? Right now, yes, yes. I'm gonna take a break for probably until the end of December. Yes. Ooh, and I, I don't mean to like I guess um I, I just wonder like what you have planned in your future I guess. It's so bad. what you're doing next um I think right now I'm reassessing like where do I want to um like what are my non-negotiables and what are the things that I'm 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 willing to be flexible about. Um, the good thing with my job at Trappler is that they are very big on, on knowing like the context behind the numbers. And um, that's something that you don't see a lot in, in um, data jobs. Like they're they're all very concerned about the numbers and and with Rappler it's it's different. Like they want to know the story behind like why is this number like this? Like why is it like that? Um, but I'm working with the data that we're working with are all like social media data, and I just don't feel good um, working with social media data. Like I feel like I'm being part of, of the cycle because um, it's basically market intelligence. So we're, we're, um, we're using Facebook data to find out like what people think about a certain product or, um, um, or like a specific um, topic. Maybe other people can do that, but I, I just, I can't, I, I really can't. Like, especially knowing that the, like the clients are like big companies that have very um, whose values do not necessarily align with mine. Like I can't do that anymore. <laughs> so now I'm, I'm looking into like companies that are more focused on bringing, um, making tech accessible for the underprivileged. So I'm probably um, in fintech, like I'm, I'm looking into um, fintech companies for that. 
Shargao. <laughs> Retreat. <laughs> yeah, you are looking in the right place. I feel like um the fintech startups here, they have a really good culture. From what I've seen yeah. from other people. Yeah. yeah. And they're always looking for data people, so mm-hmm. manifesting. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fintech cutie. I'm gonna tweet that later. Manifesting. <laughs> <laughs> if that's all we have to okay. manifest. Mm-hmm. Huh? Sorry? Yeah. Oh, okay, never mind. I thought I heard something. <laughs> okay, so after this talk, we're manifesting. Um, a nice job being freed from this system. <laughs> we are truly reclaiming ourselves. <laughs> but yes, um, thank you so much, everyone, for going tonight um, to this wonderful and intimate talk. Um, we'll be uploading the recording soon on YouTube. And um, on our camp arena, we'll be uploading um, the resources. Um, provided here and the presentation as well so mm-hmm. stay tuned for that make sure you're in our discord to get all the updates have a good night everyone thank you, thank everyone you so for more of pamela's work check our discord we dropped the link there yay thank you enjoy Bye. your evening thank you pamela thank you everyone <laughs>